Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to the very first episode of Telecast, the TV industry news review. Every week on Telecast, I'll be speaking to the movers and shakers in the international TV industry. Producers, commissioners, distributors and industry bodies, the names behind some of the biggest hits in TV. And I'll be chatting to the industry's most influential journalists to get to the heart of the biggest stories affecting the global TV industry. Telecast is about the global business of TV, so we'll be having guests on the show from all around the world to hear their viewpoints on what's happening in their own markets. Now, it obviously hasn't escaped us that we're launching this new podcast in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. COVID-19 means massive change right across the media landscape, with uncertain futures for broadcasters, streamers, producers, markets, distributors, and the rest of the TV ecosystem. So we'll focus on a range of subjects affecting those who work in the industry and try and offer some thoughts on what the new normal will look like, how to adapt and who the winners and losers might be. So thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, share it with friends and colleagues, give us a review on your podcast service and follow us on Twitter at Telecast TV and let us know what you think of the show. So let's get on with it. Coming up on this very first episode of Telecast, Edinburgh TV Festival's creative director Stuart Clark and Broadcast Magazine's editor-in-chief Chris Curtis give their thoughts on the week's TV industry news. And we'll be finding out who their heroes of the week are and who they'll be telling to get in the bin. Deadline Hollywood's Pete White joins us this week and every week from the City of Angels to give us the LA lowdown on this week's biggest TV industry news. And our research partner, K7 Media's Gert Lesis, gives us the analyst's view on a different trend he's seeing in the global industry every week. It's all coming up on Telecast. So my first guests on the show are two prominent leaders in the TV media community. A very warm welcome to Edinburgh TV Festival's creative director, Stuart Clark, and Broadcast Magazine's editor-in-chief, Chris Curtis. Welcome, guys. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me on the show. Glad to be here. Hello, Justin. Nice to speak to you. So thanks to you both for taking the time to come on the show. Let's start with you, Stuart. So you're four months into your new role at Edinburgh TV Festival. You must have had a crazy start to the year. Yeah, it's been been interesting, Justin. Of course, it wasn't kind of... uh, I don't think anyone's last four months have panned out quite quite how they expected. Um, And, you know, that's that's the same for me in a work sense in that we're not we're not running a a physical festival. We'll get into this a bit more later, I think. But what we are doing is is moving to digital and doing a whole lot of stuff between now and then. But what I have seen is kind of, you know, the industry is really behind us, which is is really great. And, uh, you know, obviously we kind of have a UK focus, but the international piece is building as well. But, yeah, it's kind of uh, it's uh, what I'd say an interesting time. It's an incredibly challenging time for, for everyone. We just have to be upfront about that. Absolutely. Um, well, it's, I think it's testament to you that the uh, the event is um, is still taking place in a, in a modified form. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you're approaching it this year? Yeah. So I think as we've seen with lots of events, sort of physical events and festivals and markets, they just they're just not able to go ahead. And we we made a call. We, we could have waited a bit longer. I think there are different ways of approaching it. You can kind of wait till the last minute to see how your allotted date looks or you can kind of make that decision earlier which allows you to kind of plan and and rethink stuff and rework stuff um so we did that but what what we are doing is we're still doing a three-day event in august we're kind of committed to that structure the mctaggart the alternative mctaggart the kind of master classes the controller sessions all the stuff that people come to edinburgh for you know, we'll still be there. Um, you know, the, the, the networking piece, you know, it's, it's harder to replicate online, but there's, there's stuff you can do as well. So what we're doing now is really sort of drilling down into kind of what, what a festival can look like when you move it to digital so that it becomes more than just a, a kind of a load of videos put up on a on a digital video platform, because I think that that's the risk if you don't get it right, is how you try and capture some of that kind of that sort of feel of something and you know Edinburgh it, it's a festival right so it's more than just kind of conference sessions it's supposed to be fun and interactive as well as a place where you learn stuff and get into the kind of you know nuts and bolts of what, what's affecting the industry and let's be honest in terms of what's affecting the industry there's probably never been a greater need for people to really talk about 
what happens next? What what just happened? What happens next? You know, where am I going to be working in a year? What's work going to look like? Et cetera, et cetera. It just carries on and on in terms of the questions. So we're going to be there to, you know, to, to get amazing people to talk about those things and get allow people to get involved. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, who we can expect to see at Edinburgh this year? In August, for the McTaggart and those, those sessions, uh, you're going to have to wait and see, I'm afraid, as we kind of... Uh, as we wait to make announcements. But what I can say today is that we will be running controller sessions and they're going to be starting from next week. I mean, people who go to Edinburgh will know that format and we were always going to do them in digital form. But in speaking to our advisory committee and others, and that, that committee is kind of broadcasters, commissioners, indie bosses, producers of all different sizes, what we heard over and over again was that there's there's just a real need to hear from those sort of industry leaders those channel bosses at the moment and not to wait till august so what we want to do is something which is about the here and now how people are navigating their way through what's happening at this exact moment and in august maybe it's a time to kind of take stock a little bit one one would hope i think it's a very very good lineup so as of next week we have charlotte moore from the bbc we have kevin ligo from itv we have ben frow from channel five we have richard watcham from uk tv we have zai bennett from Sky, uh, we have Fiona Campbell who runs BBC Three, and Patrick Holland who runs BBC Two, and we have Ian Katz from Channel Four. So I think that's a, a pretty stellar lineup. Um, and then we've also got various sort of genre chiefs within within those sort of channel groups as, and organisations as well. So it really is, you know, the the, the sort of, it's a really fantastic lineup day by day of people who are kind of running running the channels and talking about how they're keeping the lights on, how they're communicating with, you know, internally and with their suppliers, with producers, what they can and can't do. Because, you know, budgets are, you know, we can see from reading broadcasts, from reading, you know, other stories out there, we, we can see how budgets are under pressure, so how people are kind of cutting their cloth. But also I think one of the things that, that we want to do this year, you know, there's a kind of torrent of, of bad news really is and and it is bad news this is a horrible situation but i think producers and indies are you know by their very nature kind of entrepreneurial and creatively ingenious so we also want to shine a light on some of the amazing stuff that is happening at a horrible period so kind of you know that creativity in a crisis story if you like um, and that's not to get away from the fact that it is a crisis and you know if you're a freelancer if you're in certain parts of the industry you're really really facing a tough time and that's another another thing actually that for the festival this year um freelancers go free there, there'll be no charge for freelancers uh, you know we want to just open our doors and say you know if we can help untangle some of the mess help you understand x y or z or you can you know you want to hear from people then then you know tune in and, and there's no cost and that's from the stuff we'll be doing next week with the controllers and that's right through to the festival itself so um you know i'd encourage people you know freelancers who who are you know, having a tough time to, to get involved and, and register and uh, they can pick and choose what, what they want to dip into. Well, that's a, a fantastic offer for uh, freelancers who are obviously the lifeblood of, uh, of the TV industry. And, uh, and I think, we're, you know, we're going to talk a little bit later uh, about, you know, the importance of freelancers to the industry and, uh, and perhaps how this whole coronavirus crisis might help reset the balance between freelance and permanent staff and broadcasters and uh, and, and producers. But, um, well, that all, all sounds fantastic. Thank you for that, Stuart. Um, let's get down to talking a little bit about your chosen industry stories of the week. You've highlighted a piece from your former publication, Variety. Tell us a little bit about that one. So that's a piece about the Can Lions, which is another festival which has had to kind of rethink what it's doing. And they're moving a lot of kind of, uh, sort of masterclass and intelligence stuff online. And it was previously behind a paywall and now, and now they're making it free. Um, and to me, it was the latest in like a very long line of events, festivals and markets that are kind of really trying to get to grips with what you do in a year when there are very few, let's be honest, if any, physical events. And and I'm just kind of very much living that at the moment in thinking about about how you how you sort of breathe life into something. So seeing, I mean, Can Lions is also a it's a really interesting event, and they kind of go out to have sessions that are you know go a little bit further in terms of being interactive and engaging and kind of edgy and fun. 
So at the moment, I, I see what they're doing, or Sheffield, or any of the any of the big events. What MIP did, um, Series Mania, and kind of trying to take little pieces from that and kind of work out what's what, and spending a lot of time, as I'm sure everyone is on on Zoom and digital platforms, consuming content. Um, and it's just interesting because I don't think there is sort of standard best practice yet. But what I did, what I have realised actually, since we announced moving to digital, that clearly that's not that's not first choice. I don't think you know anyone would pretend otherwise. But there's also a lot of stuff you can do that you might not have been able to do in in physical form. Whether that's you know engaging with people on the other side of the planet who might not be able to fly to wherever you are, whether it's doing kind of, you know, in much more interactive stuff and, and live stuff as well. So I think I think it's just I think what we're seeing is kind of the reinvention of those industry events. And I think what happens this year is kind of people will work out what works for them and get through. But I don't think things just go back to normal next year as well. The stuff that works will will stick and I think become become the new normal. And just looking at all of those events that have either been cancelled, postponed or been reimagined in some way, as well as Edinburgh, where this year so far, I mean, this is not an exhaustive list, I'm sure, but um, I made a note of Series Mania, MIP TV, Can Lions, Banff, South by Southwest, Film Art, Hot Docs, World Content Market Moscow, Sheffield Dock Fest, Can Film Festival, Annecy, Monte Carlo, Sunny Side of the Dock, P Budapest Children's Media Conference. I'm I'm sure there's others that um, that I've missed there, but um, I mean uh, I mean I think you're absolutely right. We're now going to be able to look at those events and and the value that they offer, um, and uh, and perhaps it is a, 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 maybe a time to question the role some of them have got uh, because I think at one point. I certainly remember a few years ago having a chat with various executives and they said that they could actually spend their whole lives going from one festival to another permanently all year round. And obviously environmental impact and and various other issues around that are perhaps we were thinking a lot more about towards the back end of, of, of last year, maybe also coming to the fore now. and And maybe there are positives in a way that we can reimagine things for the better once we start coming out of this uh, of this crisis yeah i think i think you're absolutely absolutely right i mean in a sense what's happening might just accelerate the the pace of change might accelerate what was kind of inevitable to a certain extent anyway and you know it's it's glib at the moment at a moment of crisis to talk about you know people going to can to have their rosé moment but uh, the truth still is there is a need for or a demand for people to be in the same space. But of course, all those pressures you talked about uh, were being talked about ahead of, you know, this this horrible moment we're in. And that's why, you know, when I talked about all that controller stuff that we're doing um, with the broadcasters, that's why I think it becomes much more about a, sort of a year round conversation um, rather than rather than just, you know, a given couple of days in a year and actually sort of providing something substantial that, that runs throughout the year. So, you know, we'll be doing that stuff I mentioned next week with the broadcasters. And then the week after that, we're doing something with uh, the sort of production chiefs. And then the week after that with analysts. And the point is, I don't think you can any longer think about just a very, very isolated moment in time and expect people to, you know, spend a lot of money and commit to being there without giving them something over and above that. Well, I'm sure that the whole crisis uh, that we're going through now will no doubt lead to us all changing the way that we think about the ways we do business, the costs and benefits of the things that we do and um, how we might change those going forward for the for the greater good. Um, OK, thanks, Stuart. Um, Chris, let's bring you in now. Um, how are you all coping over there at, uh, at Broadcast with the crisis? Uh, we're being relentlessly cheerful. Um, uh, Justin, because frankly, there's no other no other option. It's very challenging, isn't it? It's hard. Um, I'm slightly old fashioned, used to working in a, a sort of team. I really like having people around me. I like um, uh, colleagues sort of sparking off one another, and all of that is obviously kind of very difficult to do at the at the moment. Um, awful lot of Slack messages being exchanged. Um, but definitely no substitute for a good old fashioned face to face conversation. So we're doing our best under pretty testing times, but um, there's certainly a lot to write about. Absolutely. And I'm sure there's uh, the opportunity to talk about the bright spots as well as the, the uh, a fairly unrelenting stream of bad news stories, which is which is obviously going to be coming through. 
People are watching lots of telly. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, there's some incredible uh, ratings uh, uh, figures coming through, and uh, and obviously Netflix is 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 also proving to be a uh, a beneficiary of this uh, of this terrible uh, scenario. Um, so, uh, Chris, let's let's go into your your first story that you uh, uh, that you identified. This is uh, a recent piece in in broadcast. Channel Four rocked by 800 hour coronavirus crisis. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, look. Uh, in some ways, this the pandemic's really challenging for all broadcasters. Um, it's particularly challenging for commercial broadcasters, and it's especially challenging for those commercial broadcasters which are most heavily reliant on advertising. C four being front and centre of that uh, of that group, um, and it's a double whammy for them. They're quite open in acknowledging this. It's a double whammy in the sense of their ad revenues, um, or you know. Fundamentally, their revenues have been halved in recent months um, and their almost their entire pipeline of programming is on ice um, because so few shows can actually be made under the current circumstances. So you've got a situation where you've got no money coming in and no uh, itinerary, you know, no programming coming in either. And you've got to quickly um, commission, you know, create commission, produce shows that can fill the linear schedule up. Um, uh, and do so at a time when you can't really see where your next pound's coming from. So um, really, really challenging um, circumstances. Um, and C4, are, uh, it's interesting. You could An organisation, any company facing that, could become quite defensive about it. They are um, being very... Um, uh, brave and 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 uh, optimistic and forward thinking, but they're not shying away from the challenges they face um, either. And yeah, eight hundred hours is roughly the amount of programming that um, they had lined up that was coming through that is effectively put on ice, like I say, until such time as um, normal service can be resumed. Two hundred and fifty million pounds program budget slashed. Um, which is a huge amount. How how are they going to do this? How what's their way out of this uh, of this situation? So it's it's, it's one fifty that's come off that. So there's two hundred and fifty eight million of total savings that the organisation is making, of which one fifty comes from the programming budget. Um, there's around ninety five million coming from other savings, different departments in the organisation. But yeah, I mean one hundred and fifty million um, largely from the origination budget. So you're looking you're looking at around back of a cigarette packet um if anyone still has cigarette packets these days don't know um 25 percent basically 25 percent of their of their annual origination spend needs to come out of the schedule and that's too big a cut to be um sort of mitigated here and there you can't do it through salami slicing basically um so effectively what they're doing is they're looking at um, let's say um, they had a show lined up and it was being made for 150 grand an episode. They will need, and that's now being put on hold. They will need to fill that schedule, you know, that hole in the schedule for something at significantly lower than that price, so that they actually sort of effectively bank the difference, if you see what I mean, bank the saving, and that's where they're going to need to to make up that that money. Um, and some of that can be through boxing clever and doing the kind of programming um, that you're seeing celebs or talent filming from home and it's sort of done on a, a sort of Microsoft Teams or a kind of Zoom basis or slightly more professional version of, of that. But in the end, I'm sure they'll have to fill some holes with repeats, um, with acquired content, possibly movies. But the schedules for Channel 4, the schedules for all the big broadcasters come the summer are going to look very, very different. Yeah, well, I I saw that um, Channel Five has just acquired the whole of the catalogue to uh, Golden Girls, um, and it's about to start playing that out. And uh, I can imagine we might see those sort of uh, those sort of programming decisions, presumably from all the broadcasters, just to just to fill that volume of uh, of, of lost hours. Yeah, I mean, look, the script the scripted genres are most affected by this in the sense that they are the highest tariff hours and they're often the um, genre of programming that require the greatest number of like production crew to make them. 
um, you know, it, it, you you can make a documentary with, uh, you know, it might it, it might be a producer director sort of shooting the thing with with um, you know one AP and a, and a and a kind of runner on the side, and you can you can do it with a small number of people very cost effectively, and also potentially do that still observing some form of social distancing it's hard to do that on a on a drama where i don't know the level of catering crew alone that you need would uh, be be massive so those are the genres scripted comedy scripted drama that are, 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 are toughest to do and and obviously talent as well is a major uh, uh, major issue there because you know what talent schedules are usually set up what one two years in advance uh, certainly bigger talent so uh, so that's all also going to create or add to this uh, this logjam that we're expecting to to probably run what through next year. I wrote um, I wrote uh, last week that um, September has become the kind of uh, month of choice that, that everyone in the industry is is saying to me oh that that's one for september that's one for september but frankly this idea that every single tv production that's been put on ice over the last sort of you know from the middle of march all the way through to then is suddenly going to swing back into action in september you know the, capa- the, the the industry's capacity to do that is very limited and i definitely think i mean on high end drama, on the on the stuff that's co proed by um, big American um, broadcasters or the or the S VODs, where you're talking about you, you know epic things with battle scenes and hundreds of extras and all that kind of stuff, I'd be amazed if those things are properly in production. But uh, until I don't know January of next year, because it, it, insurance is bubbling away in the background of all of this. If you know the idea that you say, okay, we've got this drama and it requires 300 people to produce it um and uh come september comes around and there's been some easing of lockdown or whatever it might be but you'd still have to be pretty brave to say okay right we're going for it knowing that there could be a second wave of coronavirus or um or that anything could could, could happen and you're uncertain necessarily about whether your insurance policy is going to cover you for that i su- i suspect for the really big epic drama it might be the new year before we see things um back fully uh, underway well I, I think that's a really good point and uh and i know uh, channel 4's uh recent new daytime show uh the steph show which was uh going to be their you know their uh, centerpiece daytime show filming in leeds uh is obviously now being filmed in harrogate at uh, uh from from steph's uh house um and it started fairly well but ratings are not looking too good for that at the moment. It has lost about uh, a third of its audience since since it launched. Uh, you know, we're talking about that sort of programming being shot from people's houses, um, low budget as possible. The drama, the the stuff that looks great on screen is probably going to be far out, going to be six, eight, 12 months away. Um, are we going to get a bit fed up of cheap tv on screen yeah i'm i i, I mean I'd, I'd have to agree i think we, we will get fed up of that i think there's definitely a novelty value and that sort of novelty factor at the moment of of, of seeing things produced in that way i think that will wear thin pretty quickly but that's where i mean look the broadcasters have got a pipeline of things that they were sitting on um or that just got in under the wire there's um you know shows that are being put through post-production remotely for example that have just fin- you know have finished their sort of principal photography and and, and are now being uh, 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 sort of edited and cut together and all the post is being done so they they have got a limited sort of pipeline of new content and they'll be they'll be strategizing about dropping that in to the schedules at the right moments between now and um let's say uh middle of the autumn uh, and then I suspect they will make clever use of repeats, um, though it helps if you're the BBC and you're ITV and you have a massive in-house production arm where you own loads of rights to programming um, so that you can you can sort of go back and, and uh, cultivate uh, and curate um, uh, parts of the Lear schedule with, with a sort of best of British. Funnily enough, I mean, like the much derided Britbox, the ITV, BBC, uh, and now C4, C5 joint venture is predicated on the idea that there's a latent appetite for people to watch Prime Suspect or Cracker or whatever it might be. Um, and that might that theory might get tested <laughs> over the summer. 
Um, and we've just broadcast, just done an interview with Dan McGulpin, who's both the head of scheduling and the head of iPlayer for the BBC. And he's talking about trying to get quite a clever interplay between those two things going forward. So, you know, they're, they're, they're repeating Gavin and Stacey on a linear basis at the moment and then push to iPlayer for the, for the complete series on box set. Uh, and that brings us on to your, your second uh, uh, news story, Stuart, which is all about the BBC history content offering in the way that they are uh, pulling together iPlayer online and the red button to educate the nation's children. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, my, my kids might burst in at any second if they're not watching it as, as I do this. But I think the point is that that's, a lot of people were saying that the BBC was maybe doing too much. But I think at this sort of moment, when you see these kind of initiatives, that thing, you know, David Attenborough and Danny Dyer and, and people like that kind of getting involved in doing bite-sized lessons, um, I, I think it changes perceptions of, of around the BBC. I think in the same way, you, you know, national insti- other national institutions have become sort of more revered and loved and I'm not necessarily putting the BBC, you know, in, in the same bracket, but I just think that the the outlook for it as an institution and for all public service broadcasters is is perhaps different to how how it looked pre pre crisis. Well, it, it's it's just a few short months since the last election, and you know the BBC was really in the firing line, seemingly from all the major political parties, and uh, there was leaks and rumours around the BBC going to get a whacking from the new government. I think was the actual term that we saw. What an incredible six months it's been for them now, because you know now they they can really come into their own, can't they? As, as an increasingly important player within the nation's cultural diet yeah it'll be an interesting time for a new director general to step in and you know that landscape as i say look looks different to you know just how it did a few short months ago chris what do you think um the bbc can do that others can't in 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 times of crisis they can make use of the things that in some ways (laughs) in other areas sort of hold them back a little bit so Stuart was talking about you know, impartiality and being tr- and being trusted. I think on this issue, I suspect the BBC is probably more trusted than just about any other media organisation in in the UK. Um, and you can really make use of that. The fact that I mean, linear schedules are a funny thing, aren't they? There's de- clearly a generational issue, and there's clearly a inexorable move away from linear towards on demand. The the, the rate of that change is obviously the the thing that's uh, most often up for debate. When you have a linear schedule like the BBC does and you have um, a, a good level of funding, and, l- and let, let's be honest, the BBC is suffering most, more than any other broadcaster in terms of its um, pipeline of content being messed up, frankly. But what they're not losing is their income. So they've got a pot of money, um, they've got linear schedules, they've got a trusted brand, and they're able to do interesting and innovative things uh, with flexible um, scheduling, flexible production, quick turnaround, that feels like it helps embed the BBC in the national conversation. And I think the the political pressure it was under before this crisis was very real. I think it will be much harder when all this ends for the government to give the BBC the whacking that you referred to, Justin, um, because the British public would have rallied round, and it's helped it be distinctive. Before this, do you remember there was a lot of um, questioning of the BBC around, um, you know, why can't the BBC be more like Netflix? And um, Netflix has got all these great shows, and it, it only costs whatever, it, you know, seven, eight quid a, a month kind of thing. And why isn't the BBC more like Netflix? And uh the answer to that for the BBC now is, well, thank you know, aren't you glad that we're not like Netflix? Because um, we're the ones that are speaking to the nation, basically. We're the ones that are feel like we're responding to things that are able to say, you know what, we're going to pull question time into the main part of the BBC One um, uh, schedule, or we're going to introduce um, sort of health check programming that will be hopefully reassuring, hopefully myth-busting for for, for, for the viewing public. And so they're able to really flex a lot of those, a lot of those muscles. So uh, 
Chris, let's uh, let's talk about your um, your second story, which was all about freelancers and the exodus that, that we're looking at uh, in the in the coming weeks and months. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's a very straightforward story, which is the vast majority of people who make Britain's television shows are employed on a freelance basis, and if there is a hard stop on, let's say, 95% of all production, those people don't work. And if those people are freelancers and they don't work, they don't get paid. And I'm oversimplifying. um, And there is uh, lots of uncertainty around government support schemes and whether certain groups of TV freelancers are eligible or not. But putting all of that to one side, you've got a situation where the freelance production community feels as though no one's really got its back at the moment, neither the broadcasters nor the indies that generally employ it. Um, And when um, the industry is run on such a um, casualized basis, when production companies are so lean, I mean, it's perfect business sense. If you run a production company, you, you you operate that production company with the smallest overheads possible at any given moment. You win a commission and you staff up hiring in the best people you can get to make the show. But the problem with that is when, we, we, when we're having this unprecedented um, hard stop on production, the cracks in that system are starting to appear. People aren't working. They're not getting paid. And at the end of it, um, talented freelance staff are going to think to themselves, can I... Um, continue to work in an industry whereby um, if things go wrong, I'm left to my own devices. And and that's the real concern at the moment, the the sort of outpouring of anxiety, um, worry, anger uh, from the freelance community is very real. And so hopefully we we may see a a reset of that, uh, the the relationship uh, between freelancers, producers, broadcasters, Etc. Hopefully that uh, you know at the end of this that we'll we'll find as many ways that we can to keep as much talent as we can within the uh, with the industry. But but presumably we are going to lose a lot of talented people um, to um, to to other industries just so they can make ends meet. Uh, because what we do know is that there's going to be a massive recession coming uh, on the back end of all of this. Yeah, completely. I mean, look. It's difficult in the sense that the industry works and operates in the way that it does for sound economic reasons. Um, But when you have a, I mean, I was going to say a bump in the road, it's a bit more than a bump in the road, isn't it? It's like a bloody great big boulder in the road or a a brick wall in the road. But it's it's just highlighted um, the issues. There is um, a shortfall. It's hard to get great SPs, uh, great DOPs, um, uh, you know, editors, like editors are like good, good editors are like, are like gold dust. Um, it's hard to find those people anyway. If some of them start to leave the industry, that, that, that's even more problematic. But at the moment, like I say, the thing I keep returning to on all of this is that so many people feel like they've just been cast adrift really that, um, uh, no one really is looking out for them. Um, and uh, that I just think the industry needs to look at the way it engages and employs people um, in the longer term, because it's there's so much work being done into trying to um, make the industry more accessible uh, and, and a, a viable career path for a broader range of people. And all this does is push it back in the opposite direction. So it's time for Heroes of the Week. This is the part of the show that we get to nominate our favourite and least favourite person or thing of the week. Um, Stuart, who are you going to nominate as your Hero of the Week and why? I think it's a nice follow-on from all the stuff Chris has been, the issues Chris has been raising. Um, And this is not someone I know, but I can see and I've been watching um, some brilliant stuff from Donna Tabera. I think she absolutely stepped up and it was more than just one or two sessions with screen skills. It was a full program or it is a full program running over weeks. And, you know, we've talked about how horrible it is for a large 
chunk of our industry at the moment and that kind of stuff is just invaluable you know people like that stepping up and chris how about you who's your hero of the week yeah here here donna tabber is a force for good uh so my heroes of the week are the uh the families that take part in gogglebox uh it's interesting that at a time when you can't go and see your mates or um go and see your your family um that you, you sort of feel like you crave a bit of um community spirit and uh i've really enjoyed um i mean i always enjoy gogglebox i think it continues to be a really fantastic show um but it, there's something very apposite about um uh watching gogglebox uh and getting a little window into people's lives um at a time when you can't um uh, you can't really sense that in other in other areas and um the, they showed the families um, responding to and watching the Queen's address to the nation. And um, a couple of the people uh, that watched it were, were sort of emotional and, and, and sort of in tears. And the cynic in me would, would sort of normally roll his eyes and, um, uh, uh, and, and be a bit scornful. But it did, it, it kind of brought together that sense of everyone in their own little isolated way, feeling the same thing uh, and having to cope with the same challenges. And so, yeah, uh, more power to uh, the Gogglebox families and the Gogglebox um, production crew as well, doing a fantastic job. And we've also got a new section in the show called uh, Get in the Bin. So as you might imagine, that is who or what is your villain of the week? Chris? Yeah, I've been flipping again. Um, the thing that is annoying me at the moment, I spend an awful lot of my time on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, and I'm getting quite frustrated at how much uh, nicer everyone's houses and bookshelves are than mine. Um, so uh, it, whether it's my colleagues who appear to be very well read, better read than I thought they were, or whether it's um, politicians with a strategically placed Winston Churchill uh, biography or whatever it might be, um, the, um, the the sort of Microsoft Teams backdrop of book sh- bookcases and um, uh, and nice posh houses. They're the things that uh, are really getting my goat this week. Stuart, who are you putting in the bin? Well, I'm loath to actually put anyone in the bin. That, that feels a bit harsh. But I did think that Eamon Holmes made a big misstep when appearing to give any form of credence to kind of conspiracy theories around around 5G. We were talking earlier about how the sort of main channels are a place, you know, a, a trusted source of information. And I think I kind of undermined that. Um, I, I don't want to put him in the bin, though, because he's bigger than me. <laughs> That's uh, pretty understandable. Um, guys, thanks so much for spending your time with us uh, today and uh, hope to have you back on the show soon. Thank you, Justin, from my bedroom in London. Thanks for having me on the show and uh, good luck with the podcast. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me, mate. One of the regular slots we're going to be featuring on the show is an insider's view on industry goings on in the world's biggest TV market, the USA. And I'm delighted to be joined by Deadline Hollywood's TV editor, Peter White, direct from LA. Welcome to the show, Pete. Thanks, Justin. How are you? Very well, thanks. How's uh, how's Tinseltown coping with uh, the coronavirus pandemic? Well, quite in the same way as many other people, I imagine, trying to figure out um, how quite to get on with the uh, the world um we've sort of moved past stage one which i guess is everyone um shutting down their major productions um and now people are trying to work out um what what comes next there's been quite a lot of chat in terms of both shows that are on the air and 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 productions that that sort of need to need to be made this year so people trying to work that out um american idol being a good example of, of one of the biggest um non-scripted shows that was in the middle of its run um, this week that they uh, they finally figured out how to uh, how to put together the live shows which was going to be a challenge so they're they're doing that remotely and filming it in each of the the contestants homes um, that was one big show and then you know the rest is is the same that, that that is marking everywhere else in the world it's you know it's furloughs it's it's bracing for layoffs and it's it's just trying to cope with this as as best we can I guess uh, I've seen a uh, incredible page on Deadline Hollywood's website, which has got um, all of the shows that have actually uh, stopped uh, production, which is you know, which is an incredibly long list. Um, so, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the major studios? What's happening there? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's twofold. We're covering this obviously from the film side and the television side. Um, and as you say, there's there's hundreds of, of shows that have, have shut down. It's you know it's a, it's a full time challenge just to try and figure them out in the first place. Um, I think what we're starting to see now is is what what comes next. Whether that's um, you know what happens over the next few months. You know, we're starting to see whether this has an impact on on deals with the showrunners. We've already started to see this morning. Marvel um, looks like they've let a couple of of their overall deal um, execs go. Um, so all of the studios are dealing with it in the same way. Um, Disney was probably the hardest hit, um, probably brought on by the fact that they have a whole bunch of other businesses, including the theme parks and the cruises, and, and they've furloughed a number of staff. And people are still still trying to work out the the impact of this. Um, what's What's interesting is to see now we've moved into the stage where you know they're talking about reopening. You know whether that's over the next few months, you know, people saying July and August at the at the earliest, um, and that's even probably quite optimistic. Um, and now you've got showrunners trying to figure out how do they actually make their shows, whether that's daily testing, whether that's um, changing the way they do things. One interesting suggestion was was making it like TV camp, where you go go away, make sure everyone's healthy, um, lock them in a hotel or a, a suitable location, um, and film from there. Um, but certainly what, uh, what's come out of this is it won't be the same as it was, you know, the craft services won't look the same. There'll be no bowl of M&Ms out on the, uh, out on the tables for the staff. You know, you can imagine there will, there'll be fewer romantic comedies and kissing on TV, uh, less, um, fewer crowd shots, I imagine as well. So, uh, uh, you know, that's all on top of, uh, of dealing with insurance and, and everything else. So it's, uh, it's a huge issue and people are still trying to get to the bottom of it. So yeah, we can expect to see socially distanced TV for uh, for some time to come. I I imagine. Um, did, you mentioned Disney. Um, uh, remarkable time for Disney Plus to launch uh, a few weeks ago, um, and I saw that they'd just hit uh, over fifty million subscribers worldwide. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, thank goodness that they had launched that at the right time, because as you say, the rest of their business is uh, theme parks and um, movies, and uh, uh, and the rest of their business is uh, is really not performing well at all. I think every parent in the world uh, is is thankful that they can shove their kids in front of uh, Disney Plus uh, right now. Uh, yes, uh, timing is is interesting. Yeah, there's been a few. Obviously, um, Peacock um, announced that it was it was launching at the end of July. Um, HBO The Max um, this week revealed that it was launching on May 27th. We're starting to see that, and obviously Quibi, which is a slightly different case, but but similarly launched a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it will be interesting to see whether there's a, a Corona bump from from any of this. I think obviously a lot of people are at home and whether whether they're watching. Um, but it does seem full steam ahead. I mean, it, the streamers, the, the big challenge that, that many of them have is the fact that the production shutdown means that many of their key titles or their launch titles have been delayed. Um, HBO Max, the biggest example of that was they were hoping to have a, a, a Friends reunion to launch their, their catalog of, of all of the Friends episodes, and that's been pushed back. So that, that was disappointing from them. Um, and similarly, Peacock um, had things like Saved by the Bell reboot, um, they still said they'll have their Brave New World um, show, but whether um, whether they've got much else, Matt Strauss, uh, the boss of Peacock, said um, a significant amount of its originals we pushed back to uh, to 2021. So yeah, it's uh, it's impacting the streamers in the same way. I think what what's interesting, and, and and this ties into the question about the studios as well. While all of this is going on, you know, production is shut down, but um, development and writing certainly hasn't. Um, we're starting to see that over the last last couple of days. There's been a, a bit of an uptick in terms of things that are either being announced now or, 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 or sort of put into into process. Um, for instance, we've got things like um, there's a William J. Mann's Tinseltown book was just uh, bought by Spectrum, which is a, a, a relatively new platform. Um, Amazon rebooting the Michael Douglas film uh, Star Chamber. Um, and I wrote a story about uh, Hulu buying the other black girl based on uh, based on that book. So it, on one hand, yes, they're they're trying to figure out what they've got at the moment, and but on the other hand, they're still trying to to look down the line and say, you know, once we come out of this, what uh, what can we do? So I think uh, I think that's the, the the thing that's going on. I, I imagine there's quite a few Zoom pitches uh, happening right now in uh, in Hollywood. And that pre-production ramp up is is uh, is obviously absolutely crucial. Um, and now we're finding that uh, also that with all of these production delays, we're going to have presumably 
trouble over um, getting talent, um, you know, because that uh, talent is one of the key things that's obviously going to sh- uh, unlock shooting schedules going forward. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's inevitable there's going to be a, a bit of a crush. Um, and they still haven't quite worked out, uh, you know, what's going to come first, you know, the idea of, of what to, what pencil are you in a in a person's uh, schedule? I think that's going to be, um, you know, the agents are going to have some fun trying to trying to figure that out. But I think until we can safely say when we're going to come back, and, and that's what everyone's been saying to me. It's you know the delay is one thing, but it's the fact that we don't really know when it's going to come to an end is is even even bigger. So there's still uh, still a lot of uh, a lot of these questions to be answered. Well, um, thanks for giving us the inside view there, Pete. And um, we look forward to, uh, for you to be joining us every week and giving us a, a, a little bite-sized chunk of uh, insider knowledge on what's going on in, uh, in L.A. Okay, so I'm uh, delighted to be joined by um, our analyst partner, K7 Media's head of strategy, Gertz Lesis. Gertz, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, Justin. And uh, so I was doing a little bit of research um, on uh, on you before uh, uh, we we started getting together on on the show, um, and I thought it was perfect timing that um, I saw that you were actually the host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in Latvia, right? Yes, yes, you're cheeky, Justin. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I, I was a, first a producer for the show for the first six years, and then we uh, were thinking how to refresh it, and um, then we relaunched with a new host, which happened to be me. So is that your final answer? That's my final answer. Yeah, I'm not going to call a friend. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to do that. Um, so, uh, so Gertz, you're going to be joining us every week um, to, uh, to give us a bit of insight into what's happening around the world in terms of TV trends. Um, uh, uh, obviously, the, there are going to be different developments in lots of different territories in, in terms of the way the industry is, um, is coping with this, uh, with this crisis. Um, what trends are you seeing emerging around the TV world as, as, as a result of the current circumstances? Well, as trivial as it may sound, crisis in general unlock creativity. And when we are talking about creative industries, it just couldn't be more obvious, right? And I think that uh, we all hoped it would be the case, but at the same time, perhaps not many expected that this evolution in terms of programming ideas and production solutions will be so swift. Uh, What we saw just a few weeks ago was, let's say, a burst of shows featuring mainly celebrities in isolation or, you know, studio hosts joined by other participants or different online tools. They play along, sing along, dance along, eat along. And, you know, it all just seemed that we had entered some endless chain of on-screen do-alongs. And now what we see just a few weeks later is, I think, a completely different story. While there are and still will be these shows around, let's call them reflective of the situation that we all happen to be in, we can feel more and more proactivity, taking matters in our own hands and just dealing with them kind of shows. So, for example, if this is a cooking show, it's about food that is healthy, practical, on budget. If it's about gardening or makeover, it's a DIY experience. You're feeling lonely, remote dating, you know, sort your problem or your four walls or hyperactive kids around you 24 7 are starting to drive you crazy no worries we'll get you advice from a professional and so on and so on so um yeah it's it's changed a lot and not surprisingly the prevailing tone that audiences are currently expecting from shows other than news is encouragement uplifting emotional fun and this trend of um looking to escape from the gloom of current you know, newscasts resonates very well with what we saw in the aftermath of 2008 financial crisis when comedy rose to become the top genre. Let's take Spain, for example. Yeah, We all know how serious has been the situation in Spain over the recent weeks, but even there, the public broadcaster has already launched an eight-part sitcom. It's called Quarantine Diaries, and it's featuring life inside 10 uh, different lockdown households. How about other types of shows? Well, it's the same story. People are looking for inspiration, for positive emotions and fun. 
And even the big shiny floor shows have already found some ways to adapt. US is uh, going forward with specially arranged remaining episodes of America's Got Talent. Denmark uh, saw an X Factor special over Easter. It was broadcast from the host's home with judges and the remaining contestants. And the show culminated in all contestants singing together. And then there's a Russian local version of uh, The Mass Singer, which is proving a big success with the recent episodes recording without studio audience, which is then added at edit stage from footage of previous shows. Then look at Quiz. Quiz and other competition shows are back in the picture again as well. Mediaset in Spain, for instance, launched a new quiz format, which is called Carenta, which means uh, 40 in Spanish, but playing with words, obviously, because it's also reminding this uh, very painful word, quarantine, as well. And in this show, four contestants every day answer 40 questions. And although it launched online, the reception was so strong that it is now given an 8 o'clock daily primetime slot on a linear channel. In Belgium, the um, Container Cup is going to launch later this month in a daily strip on Channel Vier. And this is a format in which 40 sportsmen and women from various, various sports backgrounds will compete against each other in an isolation-friendly hepathlon. Seven different sports disciplines like cycling, climbing, rowing, weightlifting, and this show will be recorded in individual shipping containers, which are specially delivered to the home of each competitor. I think that's, that sounds a fantastic format, the Container Cup. I, uh, I, I hope that gets adapted over uh, in the UK or the US, or uh, you know, I hope that, that really uh, builds into a world, worldwide hit. That's, uh, it sounds a great idea. Sports is an area that has left the biggest gaps for broadcasters around the world, not least football, Formula One, and the Olympics postponements, of course. What are you seeing in this sector? Mm, you are very much right, Justin. Uh, sports programming, as we all know, has been particularly hard hit. But here again, we see different home or virtual tournaments emerging, like uh, Viaplay launching a darts contest in the Nordics or virtual cycling tour in Belgium. And we also see esports getting a boost currently, particularly among traditional sports fans, as that's where a lot of them are finding, you know, this alternative way to release their daily dose of adrenaline. So while the big esports events have been cancelled, it's back to TV screens where it all originated. And of course, coming back to the scripted shows where the productions are still happening, we see narratives adapting to relate to what their viewers are currently experiencing. Like it's the case with a US procedural um, All Right on CBS and also in the Belgian version of the Young Adult hit series Scam. And by the way, another interesting technique we are noticing in order to find this relatability with viewers, current status is shows that are featuring um, different TV personalities who have experienced kind of lockdown situations before on their own skin, even if it's been, you know, their own free choice or at least some kind of limitation or living out of ordinary for some period of time. Think contestants, you know, being locked up in a Big Brother house or committing to experiments like a 90 Day Fiancé or Married at First Sight. And I think we can also expect more, um, you know, crossover of different genres and media in coming weeks and months, like, like filming podcasts, for example, as well. And what's also interesting, the quarantine regime has uh, brought types of interactive programming, which would naturally be associated with online media and social networks, like virtual co-viewing and commenting on uh, the on-screen material and so on. These are now also found on big 3D screens. So how do you think these innovations might influence programming in the months and, and the years ahead? Oh, that's an interesting question, of course. But, um, well, we hear media insiders talking about corona-proof content, almost like a term now arguing that there will be no rerun value of the shows um, for the shows uh, produced during lockdown due to us all being used to higher production standards and that mm, the sky is the limit kind of attitude when it comes to creative ideas. However, seeing how quickly telly is adapting to the current rules and how well the new technologies are coming to help with execution, I'm just wondering if the high-end, big-budget premium productions will regain their previous weight and glory in all schedules anytime soon. 
as an industry, we have loved, you know, to talk about how it's all about the right idea, about the story, and that inexpensive doesn't necessarily mean bad. Well, now here is this uh, reality check. The times have come to prove that we really meant what we were saying. Maybe viewers will be craving for those, you know, super expensive high-end shows to return in high numbers as soon as possible, but maybe not. I'm pretty sure that we will return to this question in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess the, you know, the super high budget, uh, high end shows, obviously, they're going to be delayed probably more than any of the other uh, unscripted shows. So it's a real opportunity for those uh, uh, great creative ideas um, that can be delivered for uh, a lower budget to really, you know, shine through and give those clearly broadcasters around the world are really going to be looking for those to, uh, to fill those those hours that we talked about, you know, that are that are um, that are missing through the football and all the other sports uh, that's missing in those schedules. Absolutely, I think that it's a time for those who see opportunity uh, and who, you know, just be being bold and moving ahead with their uh, ideas, and uh, those who will just wait for the times return where they were, where they were, um, maybe the losers. I think. Yeah, and and maybe uh, maybe it's a, it's a, a new new wave of producers who maybe have a new way of doing things that uh, that can really take the opportunity to um, to build new businesses as uh, as the whole um, coronavirus pandemic hopefully recedes over the coming months and coming years, and uh, it may usher in that new uh, new wave of talent that's uh, willing to do something in a different way. Fantastic. Um, Gertz, thank you so much for uh, for spending uh, uh, your time with us this week. And uh, I'm delighted to say you'll be joining us every week to talk about a different subject. Obviously, during this current uh, pandemic, a lot of it's going to be around what countries and what um, what broadcasters and what producers all around the world are uh, are doing to uh, to address this, the, the situation. Um, but thanks again for joining us. And uh, we look forward to hearing back from you uh, on a new subject next week. Thank you. See you soon. Telecast, the TV industry news review. Well, that just about wraps it up for this very first episode of Telecast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe, share it with friends and colleagues, and give us a review on your podcast service. We'll be back next week with more news, insight, and opinion. Until then, stay safe.